Welcome to Lecture 27, The Age of Affluence. This will be the presidency of Ike, President Eisenhower. In part one, we'll take a look at the Cold War as it develops under President Eisenhower. Away we go. The Cold War will take some pretty amazingly um, dramatic shifts under President um, Eisenhower. Instead of thinking about containment in the way that Truman did, um, new technology as well as new approaches to combating communism will make America assume the, the spy culture nation that we all associate with watching James Bond films and other um, films from the 50s and the 60s. So in this section of the lecture, part one, we'll be looking at this spy culture, but we'll also look at the dramatic way in which the United States adopted nuclear technology as the way it would deter a Soviet attack. Ike promised Americans a new look for um, his foreign policy. Um, so he did deliver in the sense that um, instead of relying on containment, uh, necessarily military aid, um, as had been done under President Truman, those things don't necessarily go away. Um, but there will be a greater reliance on use of spies uh, the Central Intelligence Agency off in foreign places, orchestrating overthrows of governments, trying to find out what the Soviets are doing. <coughs> so we'll see under Ike greater use of the spy culture. And of course, that becomes embedded in American culture in general uh, of espionage. And um, the British, of course, are going to take it um, the furthest, at least in film terms, with James Bond. One of the outcomes, of course, of relying on um, the use of spies is going to be the fighting of communists in third world nations. Nations that are usually weaker or developing and haven't yet picked a side. Are they going to go with the capitalist side? Are they going to go with the communist side? And what would the future be like if they chose communism? The United States, of course, cannot fathom a world in which these nations might go the communist way. And so the use of these spies in these places to destabilize their politics, to push these um, nations more towards a relationship with the U.S. will be characteristic of Ike's involvement in the Cold War. Uh, one of the most famous examples will be the coup in Iran, um, the operation known as Ajax by the United States to overthrow the legitimate government of Iran in order to install a pro-U.S. government. One of the extensions of what occurs under Truman and will be retained under Ike is the idea of extending spheres in which the United States will try to fight communism. So remember the Truman Doctrine about fighting communists in Europe, protecting Greece, protecting Turkey. Eisenhower will extend that to the Middle East. And if you think hard enough, I think you can realize what we are after as a country in the Middle East. Yes, it's oil. So American involvement in Middle Eastern politics will dramatically take off um, in this time period, um, and it will set the stage for the conflicts of the 70s and 80s as well in that region. Um, a great example, of course, I've already mentioned, is the CIA operation in Iran to overthrow government. Iran has um, extensive oil supplies, um, maintaining America's um, access to those supplies would be very much in our interest. Can't let the communists get the oil. 
so we can't allow Iran to go into the communist orbit. Technology also shows its hand in our ability to spy from a great distance, a great height. The U-2 spy plane program allows Americans to fly at a very high level above radar detection. Um, and it works out pretty well until 1959 when one of our spy planes is um, shot down and it's landed in the Soviet Union. The Soviets capture the pilot, and of course, America is like, oh, I guess, yeah, we were spying. Um, Ike admits that the U.S. spies, but he refuses to apologize for it um, as a result of this incident. The communists get one up on the U.S. in terms of technology by 1957. So as you can see, the, the tech game keeps raising the stakes. You got a spy plane? Ah, well, we got a spy satellite. And the Soviet satellite, the first artificial orbiting satellite, is Sputnik, 1957. Sputnik is a bit of a crisis of confidence of Americans in the sense that if the Soviets are able to put this satellite in space, what are they doing in space? Can they kill us from space? Can they bomb us from space? Are they spying from space? Why don't we have things in space? Why is America so behind? Uh, how can the Soviets be ahead? They're inferior people, and how is it that they are able to launch this satellite? So there's very much a crisis in the United States of what has gone wrong in America that the Soviets could be so far ahead of us. The United States launched incredibly um, high amounts of funding for science education. As a result, we need to catch up um, NASA is launched. From the two cartoons, you can see that involvement and investment in the Middle East um, stems not only just from fears of the Russians, you know, getting into there, extending their influence, communism can't be allowed to win, but also the fact that the holy places worth saving happen to be places that produce oil. We need it strategically for the United States, for our global dominance, and for our gas-guzzling cars here at home. Here is Francis Gary Powers, the U.S. pilot who was shot down in the Soviet Union in the U-2 spy plane incident. Here's one of those planes. The United States initially tried to pass it off as some kind of weather craft. Oh, yeah, it was a weather balloon. Yeah, yeah. Why would we need to know the weather over the Soviet Union? Um, but of course, his capture and imprisonment by the Soviet Union means that they're able to find out exactly what the US does. Eisenhower still refuses to apologize. Sputnik, the little traveler, the fellow traveler, um, really causes Americans to think wow, we are behind, what's gone wrong? Why aren't our children learning enough science so that we can um, win the race uh, for space? And therefore, this is gonna massively change America's educational trajectory. It's why today the United States puts so much investment in math and science funding. STEM is seen as the way that we globally compete. First of all, in the Cold War, global competition about not being killed by the commies. But today in the era of globalization, science and math are seen as how we compete economically across the globe. As this cartoon suggests, parents in the Cold War um, could call their kids out for not doing well in science. Do you call a C minus catching up to Russia? What a weight to bear for a child who's not doing well in chemistry or biology or physics. There is another way in which technology becomes the centerpiece of American foreign policy in the Cold War, um, and that technology would be nuclear technology. The way it's used, though, is going to seem utterly insane. 
Brinkmanship is the policy. John Foster Dulles is the architect of this. And the way brinkmanship works is the US would tell the Soviets, if you launch even one nuclear weapon, we will annihilate you and probably annihilate the whole world. I think of this almost as like a giant game of atomic chicken, where the US is saying, if you even dare to go to uh, launch, we will respond so massively that we will risk destroying ourselves in the process. That is how much we are willing to go to the edge. We will run right up to the brink. Uh, the name of this policy of massive retaliation is called mutually assured destruction. The US promises that we would destroy everything if the Soviets even think about it. So the, the idea here is to make the Soviets so scared of retaliation that they won't even launch to begin with. Now, how do you make the Soviets scared? How do you make them afraid? Well, you need large stockpiles of nuclear weapons and you need to be constantly testing them to show the Soviets that we mean business. The fear of nuclear destruction is so rampant under President Eisenhower that it leads to a high emphasis on conformity. Not only is the second Red Scare still going on under Eisenhower, but the addition of this layer of atomic death um, makes the stakes very high. Americans are deeply afraid of their future and deeply scared of what happens if you stand out. Perhaps you're a communist. Perhaps you are, you know, a threat to uh, the unity and the safety and the security of Americans. Americans become obsessed with civil defense drills in order to be prepped for an atomic attack. And a lot of the psychology here is making Americans feel safe. Um, you might call this a form of theater. That is, we run through the motions of defense. We run through the motions of protecting ourselves, even though in reality, there ain't nothing you can do if there is an actual atomic bomb being dropped on you. It's just not going to save you. Um, these little drills where you might duck under your desk. The desk is going to be gone. People build bomb shelters in their backyards in the hopes of, of living out, um, you know, an atomic attack. So you might have to stay underground for months at a time, better stock that thing with food. My favorite piece of advice was to stock it with tranquilizers so that you could keep the kids quiet while you're waiting for the radiation to dissipate. Another thing is that we see here um, a high emphasis on unity in terms of religion, where Americans think that their faith in Christianity, their faith in God is going to you know, save them. It gives them a leg up in the moral race against communism. And a side effect of that is an invention of this Judeo-Christian heritage. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. It's literally just invented. This is this idea that Jews and Christians um, share this common history, this common heritage, um, and that can be traced back a thousand years. That kind of heritage is, is a lie. It is not a thing because you look at the history of Jews and Christians uh, across the centuries and you'll find lots and lots of disagreement and conflict and hatred and death. But in the Cold War, this creation of this idea is meant to affirm our common religious heritage, our common religious background. And maybe, just maybe, if we're all on God's side together, linking hands with our fellow Jews, Catholics, Christians, maybe God will spare us. John Foster Dulles 
um, in this cartoon, uh, which is labeled with the title, Don't Be Afraid, I Can Always Pull You Back. Pushing America to the brink, pushing the Soviets to the brink. You know, this is like a giant game of atomic chicken. You know, that game where people like run at each other, ride at each other on bikes or cars or tractors, you know, in certain movies that you may have seen. You know, who's going to who's going to like divert at the last minute and, you know, be the chicken. And America is saying to, you know, the Soviets, we are just serious enough, just crazy enough that we are willing to go right up to the brink. Don't try a Soviet Union. There's a bomb shelter with their canned food and canned water so they can wait out um, this horrific possibility of nuclear annihilation in their kitty cocoon, as it's labeled here. People built these in their basements. They bought them. Um, they dug big giant holes in their yard to create them. It is, it is just wild, the links that people went to to feel secure and safe. Here, uh, people are, you know, looking at their modeling, their little shelter that you can go into underground. I guess it'd be great in case of a tornado, so probably helpful if you can get out to it in time. Um, civil defense drills in cities and towns were designed to teach people what to do in the case of an attack. Um, we're, of course, familiar with this kind of need for security. Um, if you think, for example, the modern day um, legacy of school shootings, um, the need to deal with mass violence, um, and the ways in which we go to very strong links to try to protect ourselves, to give ourselves the feeling that we can do something if there's some kind of random mass attack. Um, take psych, and we'll talk about why that is a phenomenon. I have some film here that I think will describe what might happen. And we'll describe a little about the atom. So, Joey, why don't you catch the lights? We'll try. Yeah, Joey, get those lights. <laughs> Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like bird the turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. Paul and Patty know this. No matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Yeah, throw your Here's sister Tony against going the wall. To his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. Duck and cover. Adam yeah. Boy, Tony, that flash means act fast. Part of the story of helping Americans feel safe and secure in the 50s is that the economy is booming. This is a wondrously successful economy for lots of different reasons. 
But I would like to suggest and argue that the U.S. government is actually pumping lots of money into it. You know, every scientist who's hired to build a bomb, to work on planes, all the troops and soldiers needed, every bit of the money the government pumps into the economy is going to help create a situation where people can have money to like rent houses, buy houses, buy cars. And then the United States turns around and says, see how successful our economy is? It's proof capitalism works. I have a refrigerator and I've got a stove and a washing machine in my house. Yay, capitalism. See, you Soviets suck. You don't really have a model that works. America is the proof that the good life is attainable in the American way. And so this nature of plenty, this nature of success and economic growth is proof that the American way works. Helping spur that growth even further was federal spending in highways. Um, the Highway Act of 1956 created interstates for defense. The interstates were supposed to be for linking areas so that we need to move troops, land planes, um, whatever you need to do, that can be done uh, quickly and easily. But of course, they become ways for people to travel. It helps with the creation of suburbs. You can move out of the city and then take the interstate to get back in. Um, you get the rise um, and the growth of the trucking industry to move goods very quickly and easily across the United States. It increases demand for cars um, so we can get out there and ride on the open roads and uh, take nice little vacation trips. So this is a defense-oriented policy but has all kinds of spillover effects that create even more economic growth. Let's talk about the suburban world for just a moment. Um, as Americans come home from World War II, they need housing um, because there's a, quite a bit of a shortage in housing. And so the building of new suburban houses um, creates a building boom, cha-ching, more money in the economy. Um, but this is a world for white Americans who are able to leave the inner cities and go live in cookie cutter homes built by people such as William Levitt, pictured here on the side. Bill Levitt is essentially the Henry Ford of housing. He figures out how to mass produce houses in such a quick way as to make it possible for people um, to buy a house pretty cheaply. If you're a veteran, you can take advantage of your GI Bill benefits. Um, the GI Bill will not only help you pay for your mortgage, pay for your education, um, business loans as well. And so uh, Levitt would sell you a home for about $77.90, so a little bit under $8,000. And as a result of you having this you know, funding from the federal government, you could move into one of these cookie cutter houses and enjoy this good suburban life. Inner cities became increasingly impoverished. People drained out, and that meant there were fewer taxpayers. So cities in the inner city areas started to crumble and decay as they lost tax base and tax revenue. It meant inner city shops lose customers. You know, all the customers are moving out to suburbs, so now they need a suburban place to go um, and to do their shopping. Shopping? Is that a word? I just made up a word do their shopping or marketing, as some people call it. Suburbs denied homes to black Americans. Um, Bill Levitt refused to sell to African Americans, and that was the case in many of these suburbs. So the suburbs became all white. These places um, are, you know, incredibly homogeneous in terms of, you know, the, the skin color and experiences of the people there. And you have to think about what that does to people growing up in that world where you never encounter people who are different from you. America in the 50s becomes a car culture. 
Um, everybody needs cars, two cars even, you know, mom needs a car to do all those busy, you know, PTA and shopping activities. Um, just be careful, don't run over daughter on her tricycle as she's, you know, racing out of the driveway. Um, automobile sales take off dramatically. You can see, of course, World War II, you can't buy a car. And then way dramatic increase in auto sales over the course of the 1950s. Here is Levittown from the air with all these little cookie cutter cracker box houses, as a friend of mine calls them, just little squares all dotting the landscape. How do you know which one is yours? I bet people got lost easily in the first few years of Levittown before enough foliage developed that you could kind of tell the difference. In some ways, it'd be like, you know, New Albany. Levitt's houses were easy to mass produce because they were small and they had a standard floor plan and Levitt um, designed crews to come in with specific jobs to do. So foundation crew, um, piping and electrical crew, rough-in crew, wall crew, roof crew, and as they just do a thing um, and finish, they then move on to the next house where the crew before them has just been. So the 1947 Cape Cod is just 30 feet by 25 feet. That is essentially the size of a classroom. It's a little bit bigger than my classroom. I mean, you can see um, you've got a standard layout here, standard design. Um, these are not very big houses, and that's why they're easy to mass produce pretty quickly. There is a famous song about uh, these cookie cutter houses. You might have heard this song before. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky tacky, little boxes on the hillside, little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they all came all the same. And there's doctors and lawyers and business executives and they're all made of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. Lots of covers of that song. You might have heard them before. One of the other shifts that we will see in this era of plenty, in this era of good times and high government spending, is the transformation of the Republican Party. Ike and his VP, um, Nixon, Richard Nixon, are modern Republicans. They're moderate Republicans. And we start to see the beginning of the Republican Party making its shift. One of the things that will happen here as Republicans and Democrats are shifting a little bit of their labeling um, is that Republicans will start being more directly reaching out to Southern support. As the cartoon suggests here, the GOP is stepping over into the South <coughs> where they will be able to take advantage of Southern discontent over federal involvement in race relations, as well as other um, issues of government spending. And one of the things the Republicans learn to do in this era of moderateness is to be strong support for the military because you've got to fight those commies. Can't short our boys fighting the commies. But also keep the New Deal welfare state. They realize the New Deal state is popular. They realize it's not going anywhere. They want to limit it. So we can't expand it, we can't make it any bigger, but we're gonna embrace it as it is. And so we start to see the beginnings of this shift in labels. This will change um, later um, as by the 80s, conservatives in the Republican Party will push heavily against the New Deal welfare state um, and wholesale try to begin processes of dismantling it. <clears throat> 